Hi, I'm Dr. Jack West, medical oncologist at Swedish Cancer Institute in Seattle, Washington. And I'm just recently back from the annual AACR meeting in what was a very frigid Chicago, despite it being mid-April of 2018. But it was worth the less than 24 hours I spent there just to see some of the really uh, pivotal data that was presented, even uh, though AACR is usually a, tr a uh, showcase for preclinical and early clinical work, there are actually some big clinically relevant studies in uh, lung cancer that were, were presented there, including the plenary session on Monday the 16th of April. And I wanted to cover some of the uh, key presentations there in a series of videos. Uh, the first one that I want to highlight is the Keynote 189 study that I think has the most clinical impact and in fact I'm going to start with a summary of it in one video and then cover the potential clinical uh, implications for several subgroups in uh, some videos that follow. But first, just by way of introduction, Keynote 189 is a uh, study that was presented and published concurrently in the New England Journal of Medicine by Dr. Lena Gandhi. And the study design was shown here. It was a combination of uh, of a platinum, either cisplatin or carboplatin with pemetrexid in both arms of this randomized phase three study. Uh, and then this uh, chemo backbone uh, had either pembrolizumab in two thirds of the patients or placebo attached to it in one third of the patients. This enrolled 600, a uh, little over 600 patients with non-squamous advanced non-small cell lung cancer and no EGFR mutation or ALK rearrangement. It was intended as a first line uh, therapy. And this was really uh, answering a question in a much larger setting uh, about the potential value of concurrent chemoimmunotherapy relative to compared to chemotherapy alone. Now, in the US, we actually have an FDA approved combination of carboplatin, pemetrexid, and pembrolizumab based on the randomized phase two study known as Keynote 21G that was uh, presented and published in late 2016. This led to an FDA approval for the three drug combination in May of 2017, but because it's just 123 patients and it didn't show a significant improvement in overall survival, that combination has not been that broadly adopted uh, across the range of non-squamous histology. Now, both the uh, Keynote 21G trial and Keynote 189 enrolled patients regardless of PDL1 status. So there were about a third of patients with low, uh, really undetectable or less than 1% PDL1, uh, about a third of patients with 1 to 49% tumor PDL1 expression, and uh, about a third of patients with high level PDL1 of 50% or greater. And that group of patients actually has uh, pembrolizumab monotherapy as a competing standard therapy option after the uh, approval of uh, this pembrolizumab monotherapy from Keynote 24, which, which was also presented and published in late 2016 and was clearly very superior in efficacy and tolerability with pembrolizumab compared to chemo doublet in a subset of patients with high level PDL1, squamous or non squamous. So let's move on with what the Keynote 189 trial uh, demonstrated. We had actually heard that the study was positive for an overall survival benefit, but uh, we really wanted to see how big that benefit was and whether it was really clinically significant in addition to being uh, statistically significant and also how much of the benefit was really propelled by the subgroup of patients with high level PDL1 and whether the patients with uh, low or uh, close to no or uh, PDL1 expression also benefited. As you can see in the overall survival curve, the difference uh, between the two groups overall across the spectrum of PDL1 expression was tremendous, with a hazard ratio of 0.49, corresponding to a 50% improvement in overall survival across the range of uh, the time in the curves. 
and that corresponds to a difference in one year overall survival of about 20%. It was 49.4% with chemo, 69.2% with chemo and pembrolizumab. And so uh, some have been a little critical that the chemo and placebo arm may be underperformed. We would hope to see a greater than 50% overall survival, especially in an era when patients can go on to get subsequent immunotherapy or other potentially effective treatments, maintenance therapy, et cetera. Uh, so that's a little disappointing. And uh, I'll also show the response rates, perhaps a little uh, less than we might hope to see. But nevertheless, the differences are just staggering. And uh, I would say very impressive to just about everyone I've spoken with about this. So let's move on to the question of how big the differences were across the different uh, levels of PDL1 in those subgroups. I mentioned about a third, a third, a third for less than 1% tumor proportion score, 1 to 49%, or greater than 50%. As you can see from this uh, figure with the different levels of PDL1 expression and overall survival, the greatest difference was seen in the patients with high, highest level PDL1. Uh, and that group had a hazard ratio of 0.42 for overall survival. It was lowest in the patients with less than 1%, though still statistically, and I would say arguably clinically significant with a hazard ratio of 0.59. And in between, in the, the uh, subgroup with one to 49% tumor proportion score. Uh, so really the difference was seen across the spectrum in terms of overall survival. In terms of progression-free survival, also a very impressive difference in the entire uh, trial population, the hazard ratio uh, just over 0.5, so about a 50% improvement there. And just about every subgroup uh, falling well over the uh, horizontal, uh, I'm sorry, the vertical line uh, on the forest plot showing uh, the greater benefit in all of these subgroups essentially with pembrolizumab added to the chemo instead of uh, placebo. The only real subgroup that did not appear to get as great a benefit is the uh, tumor proportion score less than 1% group. And you can see the curves in uh, this figure of uh, progression-free survival by PDL1 subgroup. Although it's worth noting that even in that group on the left, the less than 1%, the hazard ratio is 0.75. So there is a, a benefit overall. Uh, it's just uh, that these two curves uh, cross over each other, but this is a subset analysis of a much bigger trial. You can also see that in the 1 to 49 percent and greater than 50 percent, the progression-free survival difference is much more robust favoring uh, the uh, chemo and pembrolizumab arm over the chemo and placebo arms. The same basic story holds up for response rate where, as shown on the left, the overall uh, study population has a very significant difference and uh, over 28% difference in response rate. Part of that is attributable to the relatively disappointing uh, response rate of 19% with uh, chemo and placebo, but it's nearly 50% with the chemo and pembrolizumab arm. And as we saw with overall uh, survival and progression-free survival, the biggest difference is seen in the group with the highest level of PDL1 expression on their tumor cells. The lowest, but still a clearly a major difference that was statistically significant in the tumor pro proportion score less than 1%, and the difference uh, in the, the middle group is in between those, those other two, as you can see. So, of course, that's only part of the story of how we choose a therapy, and the other is the toxicity profile. And you can see in the summary of side effects that there was a higher rate of discontinuation in the patients who got chemotherapy with pembrolizumab. About 14% of patients uh, discontinued overall compared to 8% in the chemo and placebo arm. Uh, as you'd expect as well, a higher rate of immune-mediated side effects and three treatment-related deaths. But of course, that is uh, just a small fraction of the impact 
uh, of the, the more favorable benefit of overall survival uh, conferred by immunotherapy. Here you can see the range of uh, common side effects seen in 20% or more of patients. And it, I would say it's not really any surprise compared to what we've seen already with this combination, uh, at least of carbo -pem pembro in, in prior studies like 21G, a little higher uh, toler uh, toxicity issues, uh, not much more in the rate of grade three, four toxicity at all. And uh, you can see that whole range here. Also a little more, obviously, immune mediated side effects when immune therapy was uh, added on to the treatment. And Dr. Gandhi highlighted that uh, nephritis and acute renal toxicities were a little more than uh, we might have expected based on the monotherapy experience. And talking to some of my colleagues, I think many of us would be a little more wary about giving this combination with cisplatin uh, rather than carboplatin. Now, I just close by saying that uh, the trial did inclu include a crossover to pembrolizumab uh, as a possibility for the patients on the chemo and placebo arm, but only 50% of the patients uh, who were eligible did uh, get that crossover. So I think that is a bit of a limitation in the study, but overall the differences were really remarkable and I would say surprising to be seen so broadly across the spectrum of patients. Nevertheless, we do have different uh, treatment options for the patients with high level PDL1 expression of 50% or greater, 1 to 49%, or less than 1%. So uh, I think each of these subgroups deserves its own discussion of the various implications of the Keynote 189 trial and the array of other options available to them. So I'm going to talk about uh, these in the next few videos. Uh, otherwise, however, I do want to encourage you, please uh, feel free to like, comment, and subscribe, I hope, and also uh, to offer your comments, objections, questions here. I'd love to re read them and uh, try to respond either on uh, internet written comments or in some future videos. So I hope that's interesting. A lot to talk about about here and we'll get to some of that in the next few videos.